Welcome to Sausage on a Fork, a podcast dedicated to the UK's longest-running children's drama programme, Grange Hill. My name's Neil, and in each episode, I'll interview a former cast member about their life before, during and after their time on the programme. Okay, welcome to the latest episode of Sausage on a Fork, and I am absolutely delighted to say that I have been joined for this episode by none other than Renee Alperstein, who played Pamela Cartwright. Renee, welcome to Sausage on a Fork. Well, thank you very much, Neil. Um, I know it's been a hugely long time coming, and uh, I think probably we were just saying that it's probably been a year and a half since you first contacted me or found where I was uh-huh. and uh, I, I we, we call my husband the silent Rottweiler <laughs> right. which is he, he just basically when he wants to do something he just goes for it and he does not stop very quietly <laughs> till he gets to the end and I really think he's found his match in you. <laughs> so well done for your tenacity. And well, you know, it was actually that the first contact was actually was from Lance to me, and then when he told me who his wife was, that was it. I was like, right, you know, I'm going to get it on the podcast. Well, I've got so. to say, your persistence has been massively <laughs> impressive, as has been your uh, your research. <laughs> thank you. Well, that, like I say, thank you so much. For, for coming on and what we'll do Renee is we'll start the way we start every episode and if you can tell us how you first got into acting okay so where should we start <laughs> so I was born singing and dancing right. and tap dancing and loving being the center of attention and would at the drop of a hat stand on a table and sing and dance to whoever was prepared to listen <sighs> my mother who sadly passed away three years ago, grew up in South Africa and she was a very talented ballerina and her very Victorian father um, prevented her from coming to the UK where she'd won a place to join the Royal Ballet School. And it massively demotivated her and she actually sadly never really found, although married and I think enjoyed her life with her children and grandchildren, when they emigrated to the UK, was incredibly demotivated. So when at 10 years old, I begged my parents, can I please go to a theatre school? I think part of the reason that she pushed for it was because she felt that she hadn't been allowed to do it. So they did some research. They said, OK, if you get into Italia Conti, you can go, because they were the only theatre school that had a vaguely good um, academic record. Um, you can, you can go. And I, long story short, I auditioned, I got in, and I am so grateful to them that they let me go because it was a massively, it was a huge part of who I was. It allowed me to really explore and um, express that part of me. And although I had a very short and intense career, It was extremely fulfilling and it was a huge part of who I am today. It gave me massive confidence. I really, you know, subsequently when I left the business and went into the world of sort of work, um, of business, I was able to kind of talk my way into um, uh, positions that really I shouldn't have had. And I was far too underqualified for, but it gave me a huge amount of confidence. And it also allowed me, this is partly from where I came from, but the confidence that I got from being at a theatre school allowed me to be able to talk to, I I think that I could talk to a tramp on the street Uh or I could talk to royalty and feel very confident between treating them equally with equal respect. And, you know, at Italia Conti, we had you know, aristocracy, and we have people from council estates. Yeah. So you were really had a very broad, exposed to a broad range of people from a broad range of society. And I really, really enjoyed it. It was very different to, I think, a normal school experience. Right. There was always a, a, a sort of a competitive element to your, to one's friendships at school. Uh-huh. Um, 
but I, I, I think I thrived in it. And I have very, very happy memories from my school. And I'm very grateful to my parents that um, they allowed me to do it. So I was actually like, I think from about the age of 15, 14, 15, yeah. auditioning for parts and kind of in the business. Yeah, brilliant. And were you at, at Italia Conti with anyone who we might might know might have heard of? Well, yes, for sure. Um, I, I was there with Bonnie Langford, right. who went on to have an incredibly successful musical theatre career, yeah. who I have that absolute utmost admiration for. I actually saw her in a show recently, and at nearly 60 years old, she's still got it. Yeah. Um, and Lena Zavaroni, who sadly died. Uh -huh. um, um, and um, yeah, there were lots of other people that went on went on to do great and good things. I mean, it was a, a miserable building in Clapham North at the time. I went from Elstree in Hertfordshire to Clapham North every day, which was a huge, it was like a three hour commute both ways. Wow, right. But I didn't even blink about it because that's where I wanted to go and that's yeah. what I wanted to do. And I'm very grateful to my parents that they let me do it. Brilliant. And so when you, you said you were auditioning, for, for different parts was was there any sort of work did you, did you get much work in the in those early days i mean i was sort of pottering through things um i think grange hill was probably the first big thing that i did right. in fact grange hill was the first thing i was i think i was almost i was 16 when i started yeah and did it for two seasons till i was 18 i was definitely playing down so i was i was sort of 18 playing a 14 year old yeah. and 16 playing a I don't know, maybe 12 year old. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that was definitely, that was the big thing. But there was an agency attached to the school. So uh -huh. it was all very much part of your sort of schooling culture. Yeah. Um, the academic standard, which was sort of the thing that my parents thought the school would be very good for, was really very, very it wasn't great. Right, okay. I mean, it was fine, but it yeah. just wasn't great. Yeah. And in fact, since I stopped working the business, I've spent the last sort of 35 years making up for my right. sort of, I didn't go to university, uh -huh. and I've spent the last 35 years taking courses and you know, reading, I probably, I mean, I'm looking here at the whole wall behind where you're sitting now is books. Nice. Um, and I'm a prolific reader and I'm probably as well read as any of my friends who studied English literature at Oxbridge now. Brilliant. Brilliant. So, um, and that has become one of life's great joys. And yeah. so I've made up from that. We, we used to laugh. There was, I mean, if she's listening now and if she happens to hear this, I say this with the utmost respect. But our biology and French teacher was a lovely Cockney lady right. who used to speak French with a Cockney accent. And um, I, you know, we had four classrooms. My, my children have been very lucky enough to go to fabulous schools. And I, used, I remember telling them often, you know, we had four classrooms, wow. little classrooms with the old fashioned desks, with the yeah. inkwells and the little the lids at the top of the school. And that was it. I never studied a day of physics or chemistry. There were, I think there were seven or eight subjects. And that was it. And I guess if you'd have worked really hard, you could have, you know, we, we did okay. Yeah. But, Academia was definitely like the sort of add-on. You know, we had our yeah. vocational training and then we went up and we did kind of geography and history and whatever. Yeah. But, yeah, there we go. Brilliant. And now I you... can request it for one second, though. Excellent. So you've just mentioned there that you were in Grange Hill for two seasons. But when I was researching, you know, you and, and, and Pamela, I found out that you were actually uh, uncredited in one episode. I think it was uh, series two as a girl in changing room and uh, that some of the girls are having a, ch uh, having a chat so there was uh, Trisha and, and Mary and a few others and you're there in shots for the whole conversation yeah. just folding your clothes and stuff so like I that. think that was an extra part I think yeah. that was just like an extra part and they went to Italia Conti and said we need a few girls and 
I, I mean, that just turned yeah. up for that. I, there were a few things that I did during my career which were just like luck being in the right place at the right time required zero talent, literally <laughs> zero talent, other than maybe a bit of self-discipline and maybe looking the part. Yeah. Required zero talent, but I think that was one of them. And 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 one of those things then must have seen you get your face known around the world because you were the girl in don't stand so close to me. The music video of the police. Now, that must have been incredible. Just that as well. The fact that you got to. I mean, were you were you a fan of the police? Were you a fan of Sting? I mean, who wasn't? <laughs> yeah. Literally, who wasn't? You know, at that time, you watch Grange Hill and you listen to the police. Yeah. <laughs> like you know, those were like the two big things in your life. Yeah. So. I, I will first tell you, firstly tell you that getting that part was literally being selected from Spotlight, which is the actor's yeah. catalogue. Uh -huh. And they literally, now I'd like to think that they looked through the whole book and thought well, she's the one. Yeah. But in all likelihood, they might have just flicked through three pages and thought, yeah, she looks all right. We'll have her. It's alphabetical, I'm guessing. Alpine, there we go. Yeah. I mean, yes, very likely. Thanks, Neil. <laughs> <laughs> so they just literally looked, and I was called in. It was actually um, filmed at Italia Conti. Yeah. They used the because the, they uh -huh. needed a schoolroom and they needed some big space, and we had lots of studios and whatever. So we recorded there. To say I was beside myself, I, I'm not a very starstruck person. There have uh -huh. been a few people in my life that I've met where I've like hyperventilated at meeting them because they are such icons and they're yeah. just so special. But it's probably personal rather than, you know, somebody that everybody would find. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm di diverting a bit here now. But <laughs> I remember meeting um, Damien Lewis was in starred in Homeland. Yeah, now, yeah, I, yeah. I thought it was the most brilliant series. And sorry, spoiler alert here, put <laughs> your fingers in your ears if you haven't watched it and intend to. But at the end of I think the fourth series or maybe the third series, he is hung at the gallows oh. in a Middle Eastern country. And it is absolutely devastating. Eight. They went on for another eight, uh, five series. There were eight series in total. I watched all of them. I thought it was a brilliant series. Yeah. About five years ago, I was standing behind him in a queue waiting to pay for something. And he turned around and I thought my heart was going to burst out of my chest. I wanted to go up and hug him and say, D you're alive. <laughs> you're just here. It was just a very over. So, I kind of, when I walked in and saw Sting and Stuart Copeland and Andy Summers, who yeah. were the police, who were really at the height of the beginning of their careers. Yeah. I, 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 did, I didn't know what that. I think I probably tried to be a bit cool and just like didn't want to be too like groupies, yeah. starry eyed. But it was an absolutely extraordinary experience, which then went on to be now some of the people, your listeners might, may remember Top of the Pops, uh -huh. which was on every week. And you had the top 10 and the top 20. And Don't Stand So Close to Me was at number one for 12 weeks, wow. I believe. Right. The day after, so the week, I think it was on a Thursday night, Top of the Pop. Yes. Yeah. I went into school at Friday, on the school on Friday. The whole school, literally, as I walked into the assembly, the whole school literally bowed down. Wow. <laughs> it was by far and away the most outstanding moment of my career. Yeah. However, it required the least talent. It was <laughs> by luck that I got it. I, mean, I love doing it, and it was an amazing opportunity. Did you get recognised from that? No. No, it's all cut. No. And... no. I mean, now, though, if I mention it to people, they are on YouTube looking it up <laughs> quicker than you can say 
don't sound so close to me. Yeah, I mean, and, and was there any sort of like bone of contention with like the subject matter of the song? Was there any now, anything isn't like that, that? Interesting that you say that. I don't think it could be written today. Right. I think the you know young teacher, a schoolgirl. It's his fantasy or whatever the yeah. words were. I mean, it is absolutely, it's outrageous. Yeah. And I don't think it could be produced today. Right. But at the time, happily, in those days, there wasn't any wokeism. There yeah. wasn't any political correctness, which I groan at endlessly now. And no, it, there wasn't. There was, you know, it was, it was, it was kind of, it was a song and it was a... Yeah. And it was a brilliant song. And I'm very, I feel very proud to have been associated with it. But really, it was just luck that I was there. Okay. Okay. So then, so we, we'll move on then to, to Grange Hill. Um, what was you, you sort of like your audition process for that? Was it just sort of the, the normal standard thing? No, yes. Went in, I believe that on, I think I had three auditions right. and at one Phil Redmond was there right. and I kind of knew this was the guy that was behind it that had devised it and by the time I really when I went into it as Pamela Cartwright it was already right. series three it had already made a huge impact it was very popular and very successful I believe that my part replaced um Penny Lewis yeah who was played by Rudy Davis. Yeah. Have, I don't know if you've been to, did you interview her? Not yet, no, no, no. Okay, she was actually at Italia Conti. She was right. in the year below me, amazing girl. Yeah. She was actually the daughter of the authoress Beryl Bainbridge. Yeah. And she lived this very kind of, I was just a, you know, little girl that grew up in Elstree. And she lived this very funky, cool life. They lived in Camden Town. They had this huge stuffed buffalo as you walked through the entrance hall. Right. You had to kind of squeeze past to get in. It was all very kind yeah. of bohemian and, you know, yeah. writerish. Yeah. <laughs> and um, she was in series one and two. And I believe that my part was supposed to kind of sort of replace her part. Right. And... Um, she, and yeah, and so I, I, I think I had three auditions, right. and then was told that I had the part. I don't remember it massively. Uh -huh. I mean, we are talking about like forty-four years yeah. ago. <laughs> Good while ago, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, and in fact, one of the reasons when you contacted me and said, "Would you come on and talk about?" Grant? I just thought it's such a, it was like a lifetime ago. It was a different part of my life. It was a very happy part of my life. Yeah. But like, who is going to be interested in hearing about what my life is now? And my, but anyway. Yeah, you, I, I you'd be it, surprised. So in, in the very first scene that we see, we see uh, Pamela and Pamela's with uh, Susie. Who a lot of your scenes were were, were, were mm. with uh, Linda, who played Susie, yeah. but Justin and Christopher, and they get stopped by Mr. Thompson, the caretaker, because uh, they were inside and they shouldn't have been, but because they work for the school magazine, they were allowed to stay in. And you've just mentioned there about Penny. Pamela and Susie then have a discussion about Penny, because Penny hadn't officially left. She was off school. And at first, they didn't really say why she was off, it was just Susie went, she's going to be, and mum said it'll be a few weeks, but I don't know what's wrong with her, and 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 that was, and then it just, it never really got spoken about until a, a bit later on, why why she was off, but when you joined the programme, were you already a fan, I know you've mentioned that you've watched it, but were like, you, you were, were you a big fan of the programme? Um, I think I watched it, you know, I was, I was explaining to my children, about Green Chill when they were, I've got three children who are all very grown up now. I was explaining, talk, talking to them about Green Chill and I've got the recordings of all the, all the, the series, the, the episodes right. of the series that I did. And I was explaining to them at the time when Green Chill was made, there were only three or four <laughs> channels. So you did not have mobile phones. You did not have computers. Yeah. You had three channels on the TV. 
And that was it. That was kind of what yeah. you could do if you wanted to watch something yeah. or listen to the radio. Yeah. And I was trying to explain to them that Grange Hill was iconic. I think even by the end of the second series, it had become quite iconic. Yeah. And you kind of just watched it. Everybody watched Grange yeah. Hill. You know, everybody, even now, if I mention to people, you know, it doesn't come up that often now, but if I mention to people, you know, that, that, that I was speaking to someone today and they, whatever you're doing this evening, I said, oh, I'm doing a Grange Hill. This is, this was, this is a serious academic person. This is somebody who is incredibly accomplished in his, who I had lunch with today, in his business world, in his, he is a brilliant, brilliant man. He's a doctor, he's a rabbi, he's a, he's, he's a, he's an incredibly kind man. When I told him that I was doing this podcast, like, because indeed I had appeared in Grange Hill, he was just like googly eyed and just thought, oh, it's just extraordinary. So I think, I think I recognised that it was a really yeah. important TV show. Yeah. And whilst it was only, and I say that in inverted commas, only about school life, I think it was quite revolutionary yeah. in the subject matter that it addressed. Perhaps not before I joined, perhaps not in the two series that I was in, but certainly subsequently. Uh -huh. And I think that I'm actually really proud to have been part of it because yeah. I think Green Chill addressed sex and drugs and rock and roll before it had really been addressed in a school with a school yeah. in the background, certainly like a comprehensive school, yeah. before anybody else. And I think that has been recognised. Uh -huh. In fact, I believe that some of the cast members from subsequent series went to meet Michelle Obama at the White House where they received some sort of award for um, bringing to the fore and to, to sort of public discourse the um, these very difficult subjects, yeah, which it... absolutely subsequently became really very, very helpful for young people. Yeah, it was actually it was Nancy Reagan who they met. Oh, it? Yeah, Reagan, it was Nancy was Reagan that? because of the, the, the Just Say No drugs campaign. There we go. And that's what that was there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, my sort of era of, of Grange Hill was from about 82. I knew about Grange Hill and I knew Tucker was. So, it's, when I've sort of revisited the, these things at the time, I always think Pamela Cartwright, good girl, clever girl, you know, academic girl. When I, when I was researching your character, I thought she can be a little bit catty when she wants to, can't she? You know, she. she <laughs> She wasn't backwards and coming forward, shall we say? If she had an opinion on something, she was going to she was going to let people know. And yeah. there's a bit where um, they're talking. She, it was Pamela decides they need to hold a meeting to discuss the fact that they weren't allowed in at lunchtime. I love this. She asked Tucker and his mates if they were going to come to the meeting, and Tucker said they had better things to do. And Pamela replied with, "Well, let's hope it stays that way." <laughs> And I just loved that. She was, she was, she was, I mean, all, I, I can't remember a lot of the lines, but I do remember she was always going to a meeting. There was yeah. always a <laughs> meeting, or there was another meeting, and she was always organising and getting everybody. And I just thought, this, this girl is going to go on to become, uh, do something very powerful. Brilliant, brilliant. And there was a, there was a, there'd been like a space of vandalism in the school. And, um, Pamela, again, is talking with, with some of her friends and some of the lads as well about who've been doing it. And she said the boys should have an idea of who it was because they were boys. And, and you know, like, just like, they, they should have an idea who it was because they're the boys and so they must have an idea. And oh, then she, you couldn't write that in a No, now, and then she, said, then she said, well, I, don't, I didn't mean it. I just because boys are, are a bit more boisterous uh, so you know it, it's likely to be one of them or, or... very controversial yeah but <laughs> it, it, it then led on to a, a conversation then about Tucker saying 
he, he, he would have had a bet that it was Booger Benson. If we all remember Booger Benson, who was the, the bully at the time, and David Lynch, who played Booger, has actually been on the podcast, and he, he, he could, you couldn't get a more different character than, than Booger Benson. They, 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 David's great. But he, they have a conversation then about if Tucker could throw Alan in judo. He said it was a waste of time because you couldn't give someone a smack in the mouth. And again, Pamela says that Tucker didn't need to worry about that because... Nobody had a fist big enough to fit in Tucker's mouth. <laughs> she was um, extremely acerbic. Yeah, I mean, because mm-hmm. outside of Grange Hill, Todd Carty was like, you know, he was a massive heartthrob, wasn't he? And he, because he, he was Grange Hill, wasn't he? It was like Tucker was sort of the character. Completely. But, but Completely. on Grange Hill, Tucker Jenkins had no luck with, with the girls. <laughs> whatsoever and I love the fact that he did that you know I love the fact that he never seemed to have a girlfriend did he you know and you know we saw countless times you know time there was times when he tried to ask Pamela Cartwright out but he always you know he would change his mind about at the last minute and and not do it and there was a time where the school disco was going to get cancelled because of the vandalism and Tucker had caught Booger and Gilbo Booger's mate vandalising the school and so he told on them and the, they you know they got caught and the disco went ahead the, so the disco actually happens and Pamela told Trisha and Penny that they'd have to thank or Trisha and Susie sorry that they'd have to thank Tucker for saving the disco but he didn't really want to do that because it was Tucker Jenkins and you know <laughs> they didn't really uh, they didn't really care for him but Completely. Tucker's trying to hide from Mr. Baxter at one point. So he grabs Pamela for a dance, which I thought, you know, he, maybe he's going to ask her out, but he, he didn't. And later on, Alan Alan asked Tucker if he would walk Pamela home because that meant Alan could walk Susie home. And Tucker's response was, oh, do I have to? <laughs> <laughs> and you just think, Mate, your chance is there. Why aren't you taking it? But as they were leaving, that's when we saw Booger Benson coming in. And I don't know if you remember much about that because Tucker got quite a beating from Booger Benson yes. at that point. I don't know if you remember much yes. about that or if you have any particular stories or anything like that because when I was speaking to David Lynch who played Booger, he said there wasn't really there was a, there was a little bit of sort of choreography but not a great deal. I, thought, but I, yeah. I mean I don't remember the absolute details I kind of do remember that Tucker had a thing for Pamela yeah. and she kind of made a few hideous comments to him <laughs> that were absolutely crushing. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I know I, 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 it was, Neil, it was a yeah. little... Yeah, no, 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 I, I mean, when you're talking, I can kind of visualise the scenes. Yeah. And I can visualise it. I can kind of remember-ish what I was wearing... Yeah. But I don't remember the great deal. Well, I mean, the, the thing with Booger Benson, the, that scene when they're walking down the corridor and he appears, he is terrifying. He's absolutely terrifying in that scene. Yeah. And it's like, where do you think you're going? And you just, even now when I watch it, I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm nearly 50 and I watch it and I think, oh my God, he's so good. He was yeah. so good at it. He was, he was so menacing. Now, you've mentioned there again about Pamela always going off to meetings and stuff. And she, Joined the school magazine and thought her and Trisha should work together for better school meals because Trisha was on the school council. So Trisha went round to Pamela's house to discuss it. And everyone says that one of the main reasons Grange Hill was so popular, as you've said as well, was because of the, the way it handled real topics. And, you know, this one's quite prevalent today is where Trisha actually says some kids need a big meal during the day because they don't get one when they go home. Yeah. And, you know, you just think, of blimey, for a kids' programme to be addressing that in 1981. Amazing. It, it's, it's unreal, isn't it? You know, and, and you talk about, like, the big storylines it has, but even something as small and throwaway, like, for that, for that to be getting said. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. I think those were the things that really got um, it attracted people's interest. Yeah, and there was so much that you could, there was everybody, all 
the characters, there was somebody that you could relate to. Yeah, definitely. So they decided that they would conduct a survey to see what type of meals the children wanted. And this is the type of thing that, because they, they Trisha was doing it on a typewriter, right? And again, Pamela's... Yeah, Trish was just wonderful. Yeah, yeah. She was just wonderful. She was just... I mean, she was so well cast. Yeah. And she was just like, she was really, she was like the female icon of uh, Grange Hill. Yeah. Oh, can I ask though, who were sort of, who, who were your sort of best friends when you were, when you were filming it then? I mean, I didn't have best friends. I took it quite seriously. Right. I was like friendly to everybody. Uh -huh. There was one lighting cameraman that kind of took me under his wing uh -huh. and was just incredibly helpful and very kind to me. You know, you've got to remember you're, you're dealing with, you're working at the BBC yeah. who are doing these things all day, every day. And you have got a cast which is essentially full of kids Yeah, and they were incredibly forgiving. So because they knew that for a lot of us, it was our first big TV thing. They were they were very understanding. I think the the majority of people who were work. I remember it being a very professional environment, and you know all the actors taking it very seriously, even the extras. You know, quite especially as it was Grange Hill, and it was such a sort of iconic program yeah. to be working on. Um, but I just remember this. I wish I could remember his name, but I can't. But he was a, a lighting cameraman. And he told me, gave me some great advice and was incredibly helpful. And, you know, said to me, you know what, Renee? I remember him, one of the things he said to me was, just be nice to everyone. Yeah. Because today's runner can be tomorrow's director. Yeah. And just, I think instinctively, I was nice to everyone. Yeah. But I have, lis I listened to that, you know, don't be a prima donna. Don't be a, you know, you're not so great. You're just another human being. Yeah. And everyone's a human being. And that actually has stayed with me for life. Yeah. The, 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 the other, you know, the people on the show were, they were good. Linda Slater, who played Susie, was fabulous. And we, we, we were at school together. And we knew each other from school. And I actually went on holiday. I had my first holiday after I finished the second series of, Grange Hill I had my first holiday without my parents with three of the girls from Grange Hill and um that was in Ibiza and that was a big eye opener <laughs> that was that was growing up that was probably yeah. growing up but they were there was a great sense of I'm sure everybody who you've interviewed from Grange Hill yeah. will tell you there was a great sense of camaraderie I think we were all felt we were part of something that was you know a, a, a big success yeah and I think everyone felt a, a, a sense of responsibility. Brilliant. Yeah, brilliant. So, you know, and we said there about the this, this survey and, and Trisha was typing. And again, Pamela's a cervic tongue coming out saying, well, you're not very fast, are you? You know? <laughs> she was really snotty. Yeah, yeah. She was very snotty. And yeah. she had no patience for anybody. And she just wanted to get done what she wanted to get done. Well, I mean, I love the fact that when they did the survey, it was Mrs McCluskey who said she was happy with what they'd done and, you know, she would review the situation after they'd had the results of the survey. And Gwyneth Powell, who played Mrs McCluskey, I always talk about it because she, she came on the podcast a few months before before she sadly passed away and she was just the, the nicest person. She was so nice. And like, I, we stayed in touch afterwards and, like, she'd message me on my birthday and stuff like that, you know, just little things like that. She was just... Just a nice. I mean, I remember her being a really lovely, warm person. And I actually thought, really good actress. I, I remember watching her and actually looking yeah. at her and thinking, how is she doing this? Yeah, no, she was, she was, she was something else. Like, now there's another bit where we, I mean, we've just talked about like covering like serious issues and stuff. And there's a bit where Pamela and Susie had a conversation, which seemed to be about Pamela had seen Andrew Stanton buying and drinking alcohol mm. and again in in a kids program that's that's just unheard of isn't it you know 
and he was later found uh, drunk in that episode. And in that in that same conversation, going back to Penny Lewis, we we find out that Penny Lewis wasn't in school because she was in a cast. She fell attempting a triple bar and was in a cast. And again, Pamela said, "Well, she's only got herself to blame, hasn't she, <laughs> for doing that?" So you she know, that, was a very warm, you know, person, wasn't she? Just the uh, the compassion was just like, you know running through her body there, <laughs> like so. Yeah, you know she's always saying things that were beyond her. That was the was another thing that that got said, and like we said about Tucker, always seems to have had a thing for Pamela. And there's a bit where he th- you think he's going to ask her out, but he goes all and he and in the end he just says, uh, "Can you tell Mister Hopwood that Andrew Stanton's going to be off for a yeah. few days?" <laughs> um, yeah. I think I remember. I mean, I don't remember a huge amount of of, of the script or what happened. But I do remember there was a scene where I was in a queue for um, lunch and he overheard me saying in response to somebody saying, um, oh, what, something like, do you, I mean, this is, do you fancy Tucker? And yeah. she and Pamela, and I think I replied something like, oh, my God, I'd rather walk over hot coals than go out with him. Susie was telling uh, Pamela that Tucker fancy there. And Pamela said she'd rather go out with Penny Lewis's pony. What was the response? <laughs> she would rather go out with Penny go. Lewis's okay. pony than go out with Tucker. There but yeah, go. now that there was a bit where Pamela was talking to to Susie about it, because, and Pamela hinted the fact that she was a bit jealous of the fact that Susie was going out with Alan, or at least they'd had a. A letter had been had been left in Susie's locker or Susie's desk um, from Alan, but it was actually actually Tucker and Tommy had written it. But Pamela was a little bit jealous because she said that no one ever seemed to ask her out, and I just thought that was good to be showing sort of Pamela's insecurities as well about it. She thought there was something wrong with her, you know. And one of the reasons that she thought no one was asking her out was because. And I love this. It's such a first world problem. She had to muck out the horses' stables, and she thought that lads lads thought she might she might smell. And I just think that it's it's such a but it's such a it's kid so thing. It's such a teenage thing, isn't issue, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. No, there's a bit where again. But I think. Sorry to interrupt. No, not a problem. I think that's where that's where Green Hill was such a success because through this brilliant script. Well, this very simple script, but I think excellent script. It it, it, it voiced things that teenagers yeah. were thinking, yeah. and kids could relate to it. Definitely. And I'm sure there must have been thousands of incidents where kids were thinking, "Yeah, that's me. That's yeah. me thinking that, and that's my concern. That's my insecurity." Yeah, definitely. And I, and and I'll be honest, there was times as a as a lad growing up where I'd go and think, "Right, I'm going to ask this girl out." But you'd say something completely different, and and it never ever materialised, you know. And there's a bit where Pamela and Susie were talking about their options, and Pamela had said whatever they they chose. Her dad had said that would decide what they would do in the future, whether they'd get a job or whether they'd go to university. Now, whenever I'm put on an episode of the podcast out. I do a guest the guest competition uh, on social media. Or the, or the first person to guess who the next guest is then gets asked to ask a question to the following guest in the following Did episode. somebody guess that I was going to be the next No, guest? no. So this was for, for Kim Benson for the last episode. But, right. but but So this question's coming for you for this one. So it's someone called Tammy Ann. Now, Tammy Ann, whenever we do this competition, she, will, she just comments, I've got no clue. I've got no clue who this is. But on the last one, she was the very first person on the very first day. She guessed. She said, "This could be Kim Benson, who played Mary Johnson," and she was right. So right. her question is: bearing in mind what we've just said about the fact that you know uh, about going to university, her question is: What do you think Pamela would have done at university? What do you think she would have studied at university? That's a great question. I mean, because she was such an organizer. And she was sort of, uh, I, I think she would have studied international relations. Right. Okay. I think that probably was there. Or 
because she was so interested in so many things, yeah. she might have studied theology because right. you've got everything from religion to history to geography to literature to philosophy. I so I would I would have said mm-hmm. either either international relations because she is going to go out and I would have thought ultimately Pamela would have become a diplomat of some sort. But um, I think theology would have also interested her because she had so many interests yeah. and she was, I think she was quite smart. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant. Now, there was a thing towards the end of that series or, or in, in the last episode where there was a battle of the sexes uh, competition. Oh, yeah. Now, yeah. That, that, that all came about because... Doyle, you know, he was he wasn't very likable, was he? But he'd stolen one of the younger girls' bags. He'd stolen Preston's bag, and and Pamela was trying to get it back. And in the end, Tucker and his mates got it back. And Tucker made a comment about the girls being the weaker sex. So there was this battle of the sexes, and you were involved in the netball match. And when you watched that, you actually scored quite a few. You had like quite a good aim on your day. Was was netball your thing? That's really interesting. I mean, so my father was a was a was a really good sportsman, right? And it became very apparent early on that I wanted to sing and dance, and and I did ballet and jazz and contemporary and tap and just like like every form of dance that you uh-huh. could do. But I think that somewhere, and my mother was a ballet dancer, and my father was a great footballer. Right. And he actually played for his um, country, South Africa. Wow! Um, not nationally, but for a in a but yeah. sort of a special league. And um, I, I mean, I'd like to think some of it passed down. But <laughs> actually, when I think about my heart, hand, eyeball coordination, yeah, in kind of games like tennis and whatever, mm. it wasn't great. <laughs> so I think. You know, I, the thing is that I would have a really good go at anything. Yeah. So that's probably what came through. I have, since I've like been the year from the year dot, I've always enjoyed exercise in some uh-huh. way. And I still, it's still a huge part of my life and um, really important and fundamental. Like, I don't know, some people, whatever they have to do every day, I have to exercise. Right. You know, it's just yeah. like really if I don't, it's just Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But so I would like I was kind of thinking, well, maybe yes, netball, some sort of history, but not really, no. That's right. I mean, okay. Yeah. I mean it, it and then in true Grange Hill fashion, the battle of the sexes was declared a draw, obviously. And that moves us on to the the Christmas special w- was on a Christmas in 1981. Now, this this is the very first episode I can remember watching. I, I must have watched it. I must have watched Grangeville before, but I remember this. This was written by a Blue Peter competition winner, this one. And when you watch it back through adult eyes, it's so obvious that it was filmed at a different time to the rest of the series because everybody looks different. Everyone's got different hairstyles and every, everyone looks older and, and was this part of which series was this part So this of? was sort of the end of its series, for your first series. But it was, so it would have been, series four, I think, was your first one. And that would have been on at the start. And then, so it was at the end of the year. So it was at 1981 Christmas. And it, as I say, it was by, it was written by a Blue Peter competition winner. And Tucker was still watching Pamela from afar, even though he told the lads that she'd have no chance. <laughs> with them. No, just as an aside, when when I was watching it the other day, the entrance fee for the disco in 1981 was 75 pence. And that included one drink and one sausage or one cracker. Now, I don't know if that's a Christmas cracker or a Jacob's cracker. I, 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 I don't know. But anyway, and, and Tommy had told Pamela that she needed to put an order in for a dance with him before the rush. Because, and... <laughs> Pamela told him it was a good job, he told her, because she might have made a mistake and waited for him and then dropped two full cans of Coke on his feet and walked away. Oh, <laughs> he was such a meanie. But, and, but, <laughs> during the disco, Baggy Trousers by Madness is playing in the background, which, oh. by the, 
By the oh way, best, best band oh in the world. God. Best band in the world ever, bar none. That's playing. But then Tucker looks around the disco and he sees Pamela being asked to dance and the music changes in Tucker's head from Baggy Trousers to, <laughs> to Miss You Nights by Cliff Richards. <laughs> And I think as the music actually changed, but then Benny starts talking to Tucker and Baggy Trousers comes back in. So just showing that Tucker's still got uh, those feelings for for Pamela and he still still didn't ask her out. And then it's just your last series, Series 5, and you were only in one episode in this series. And it was when Pamela's brother, Matthew, had brought home a letter about sex education that his class were doing. And right. we saw Pamela at home with her mum and dad as well. Yes, I and, remember that. I remember that. And people people who have been on always say when when they got like a family in Grange Hill, it, it was it was so good and so different because obviously the set was different. But it actually sort of gave their character a like sort of a more rounded feel. Yeah. So would you agree with that? Yeah, completely. Would you? Right. Completely. I mean, it was very, the Grange Hill, for me, most of it, I only, I didn't do very much in a home setting. Yeah. Most of it was at the school. But there were two very different lo- locations where we filmed. So we were either in the studio at BBC, yeah. at the BBC in White City, um, or we were out on location at a school location. Yeah. So there were two very different settings. Um, did that make a difference? I, I mean, I don't remember it feeling all oh, this is a an added dimension. Uh-huh. Um, no. Right. Okay. And Matthew didn't really want to do sex education because Matthew, being the way Matthew was, he was, you know, he, he was he was quite uh, sort of immature in in many respects compared to what what Pamela was. And Pamela yeah. had a bit of a go about him about being embarrassed about it. Yes, and, and I, the- I remember that. I remember the, the family was quite sort of square and sort of sort of middle class yeah. and yeah. Yeah, I mean I, I like I, I say that, but I also thought that Mr. Cartwright looked like he could he could you know he, he could look after himself if it was necessary because he's a really, really tall bloke. And he just looks like if anyone was to get on the wrong side of him, you know, he's gonna let them know. I I, I remember he looked quite different to what I imagined. Mr. Yeah. Cartwright would have done. Yes. And then we never saw Pamela Cartwright again after that. Now, yeah, it was, I think it was it was series five and it was the fifth series. And I know they were bringing in other sorts of characters, but it just seems strange that these, these you know, being the most famous kids in Britain and these just sort of, sort of faded out of Grange Hill. I mean, there was no explanation. No. There was, a, I mean, you know, each series I think was eighteen episodes. Uh-huh. There was quite a lot, and um, I, it was kind of an. It was would if I would have been offered another series, I'm sure I would have carried yeah. on with it. Because who turns down Green Hill? Yeah. But for me, two series, I really felt like I got the most that I could out yeah. of it, and I learnt. I'm so grateful to have been able to do it because I think to have had that as your first sort of really big yeah. role with the understanding of the sort of technical people because yeah. the majority of the cast were kids and the immense sort of sense of pride because it was such a sort of a national icon that you were working on. Um, it was it was the most wonderful experience. It really was. And it was a real privilege to have been, have taken part in it. And especially subsequently and looking back at you know how successful it continued to be yeah. and the, and and actually more meaningfully the impact that it had on yeah definitely on the audience yeah and what was the public reaction to you and, and Pamela like so yeah that's 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 a funny question so um <laughs> well it's a it's so probably about four or five months in, yeah. I literally couldn't go anywhere without being recognised. Wow. And half the time it was just like I'd be, you know, I was travelling to and from the tube, on the tube, yeah. virtually the whole length of the Northern Line every day from uh-huh. 
my father would drop me from Mel Street to Edgware Station and I'd go from Edgware down to Clapham North. And invariably there would be some kids on the train and they'd start saying, is that her? Is yeah. that her? That's her, that's her, isn't it? That's her. And sometimes I'd say, yeah, it's me. It's, it's me. Um, and, you know, to, and, and, and I literally couldn't go anywhere without being recognised probably for two years afterwards as wow. well. Right. And in fact, I went to the theatre, I remember when Cats first opened uh -huh. in the West End. Yeah. And I went to see the production and I literally could not get out of the bathroom in time for the curtain up in the second act because there were so many school kids there who were wow. saying, oh, Pamela, can I have your autograph? It's so nice to say. I mean, it was really, it was sweet and it was lovely. And you know what? I think to have that the whole time must be really, yeah. really challenging. You know, you stand in the front line and you have to expect the risk reactions. But it was certainly was a very long, there was, you know, probably about three or four years. And then I had something hilarious happen subsequently. Um, this was years later, probably about 20 years later, uh -huh. we were skiing and we were staying at, at this little hotel and we had a lovely day skiing, showered, came down to the bar, went up to the bar and... Um, it was in France. There was an English chap working behind the bar. He said, excuse me, I have to ask you, were you Pamela Cartwright in Grange Hill? <laughs> and I looked around and I just thought, no, I don't believe it. I am, look so completely different. This is completely out of context. And, of course, a friend of ours who was notoriously always like, you know, would come into my house and take the Grange Hill books off the shelf and say, oh, Pamela, Pamela, had gone up to this barman and said to him, do me a favour, when my friend comes down, I'll show you who she is, ask if she's Pamela Cartwright from Grange Hill. Well, it was hilarious. It was really, it was a really, really good one. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it was definitely, I had a, I definitely had a, a moment of fame. Yeah. And, uh, it was... It was interesting, but actually, ultimately, I think it must be really, really all yeah. joking aside, really difficult yeah. not to be able to go anywhere anonymously. Yeah, I mean, it, it must be daunting as well for you to just suddenly be have that thrust upon you as well. It, it, it must, as you said, it must be really challenging as well. For me, because it was limited to sort of four years, it was novel and it was... Yeah. Very, and it was like and it was all associated with such a wonderful production and such a great um, program, and it was you know it was a, a very happy association. But yeah. um, I think to go through that, you know, people who are very high profile in the public eye to have yeah. that all the time, yeah, I, I don't think that can be underestimated. Yeah. Okay, and so then, so after Grange Hill. I looked, and I always say about IMDb, I know it's not the most reliable, but there's not a great deal for you on IMDb, but there is an episode of uh, Marmalade Atkins, Marmalade at Work, and it's about when she goes to a, a fame, like, you know, like a theatre school, and it's it's the kids from shame, rather than as opposed to the kids from fame, and you were one of the kids at the school. And the cast list for that episode was when I was looking through it, it was is unreal because you know you had John Baird and Callum McCready were in every episode because they were in Mum and Dad, but then to have Jim Carter in there and Elizabeth Jim Eston Carter, Jim Car that, I mean he's a legend. You know Elizabeth Estenson and Danny John Jules is there, you know, Michael Sundin and Chase, and there's all these people just in it. I mean that must have been an experience because you, obviously you were already established then, but. You know, when you look back and the fact that you've worked with those people as well, that I was know, amazing, 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 amazing. And I mean, yeah, and it was a great, it was a really, it was a, a you know, although it was really a children's program, yeah, you know, you're working with great legends, and and yes, that was a that was a, a, a really thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyable job. I mean, I, 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 I looked at that episode, and there's one clip, and it's the, the finale. Um, the song and dance routine at the end 
Yeah. And again, I mean, you... that was that was actually sorry to interrupt. Oh, sorry. That, was, that was my favorite thing. My thing right. that I love. I love Grange Hill. I love the work that I did. I really enjoyed the work. But my thing was big belty theatre numbers. Yeah. I loved. I consider. I was a. I was like. A, I was an actress. I was a dancer who could sing and act. Yeah. So my thing that I loved more than anything, and sometimes I'll go to the theatre and I will see a big, belty, full-on number. Yeah. And that's what I loved. That is what I enjoyed so much. And that was me. And I was very, I was fortunate enough, I did lots and lots of pantomimes. Right. Now, it sounds silly and it sounds like it is silly and, you know, but we always had great cast members there was always a huge sense of fun. Yeah. And the big belty dance numbers. Generally, I worked with really great choreographers and, um, you know, there was always a, there were always sort of like, you know, celebrities and, and fun cast members. And the, the standard was very high and people took it seriously. But because it was pantomime, there was always a huge element of fun. And for me, my favourite work was big, belty, blasty dance numbers. And uh, you know, now I've you know I've got very musical children. Yeah. One of whom loves um, Bach chorales, and uh, they take always all took their music very, very seriously. But for me, those big, belty musical numbers are my absolute favourite. Yeah, and and that one in that program. Right, as I say, that's the only clip is is that sort of uh, the the big finale. And I have to warn people: if you're going to go and watch that, that's going to get stuck in your head because for the last few days I've just been singing even a bad guy, and I'm like, where is that? You know, it, it, honestly, I've only watched it two or three times, but honestly, even yeah. a bad guy. Ah, like, oh, you need to. Yeah. Stop. Um, but on that, because you know, as, as a kid watching that. You know, it's Marmalade Atkins, she's a naughty schoolgirl. When you watch that through adults' eyes and you look at Charlotte Coleman in that, and she is unbelievable. Yes. I, 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 I just I watched it and I just thought yeah. she, she's unbelievable in that because, as I say, you just assume she's, you know, as a kid, you're watching a naughty schoolgirl, but then when you watch it again as an adult, you just think she, she was absolutely yeah. incredible. So that was that. But then was Tucker's luck never an option? No, that didn't ever really come up. Right. That didn't really ever come up. No. I mean, I think shortly after um, I completed, I finished uh, Marvel Aid Atkins, I, um, I, I also did a series of commercials, which was also dancing, which I've got to say was really my favourite thing. Right. For um, a company called Kinney Shoes, which were the MBA, National Basketball Association, right. kind of sh sponsored shoes. Um, and they spent a fortune on a series of commercials, which I was in all of them. It was without question the best paid thing that I ever did. <laughs> right, so and that was, that was really good fun. And I did that. And then I auditioned for, um, there was an actor called Gerald Harper, Right. Who was very? He was very famous for. He was. He was always typecast as sort of like the English country gentleman. Right. And he very entrepreneurially had set up a company called Intercontinental Entertainment, which took plays to the Far East and Middle East to entertain expatriates who were starved of culture in the Far East and the Middle East. And he took three plays out there every year. Um, to um, entertain these people. So they would go into very smart five-star hotels, take over the ballrooms, make a theatre, and people would come in and have a sort of black tie dinner and then watch one of these plays. And so, no, sorry, it wasn't Gerald Harper that did it. It was Derek Nimmo. Do you remember oh, Derek, Derek Nimmo? Nimmo? Yeah, yeah. Derek Nimmo. Sorry, Gerald Harper was in the play. Right. But Derek Nimmo, who always played the sort of, priest in yeah in all, that's what i picture uh, i picture a priest yeah, when exactly. i think it's Sorry. Terrible, yeah. um gerald Hulk was in the play so i auditioned for him for a terence Fris frisbee play called there's a girl in my soup oh, right. and um and i got the part of paula the au pair okay. 
-huh. And we toured 16 countries in the Far East and the Middle East. I think I was, this was about a year or two after I finished Green Chill for six months. Right. Now, whilst I'd, you know, had some great experiences, I, we hadn't traveled a huge amount while I was growing up. And here I was, this like 19 year old schnip being taken first class to stay in the most fabulous hotels in I think it was 16, 17, 18 countries in the Far East and Middle East, from Hong Kong, Bangkok, Kuala Lumpur, Dubai, Abu Dhabi, um, Indonesia, Kuala Lumpur, Egypt, yeah. eating in the most fabulous restaurants, whereas I'd grown up eating in sort of wimpies and fish and chips <laughs> and, uh, and, and flying first class around the world in this fabulous play with some really great actors and actresses. Um, and that's probably the thing that I enjoyed most. Not so much, I mean, the play was great. There were some great people and Bill Maynard was in it yeah. and Gerald Harper was in it. There were some really great um, people in it. And, um, but the, just the opportunity to travel so far and wide and was just, was immense and I, I absolutely loved doing that. That was really, and then by the time I, I got back from that, um, I was dating my husband uh -huh. and after six months apart, he said, listen, I would really like, I think we should have a future together uh -huh. and I don't think we can do it very successfully if you're gonna go off for six months at a time. <laughs> and the truth is with the business, you have to be committed to doing this sort of thing because unless you are, you know, George Clooney, you can't choose what you want to do right. all the time. So, you know, it wasn't going to, and I ultimately knew that I, a family life was going to be more important to me than anything. Yeah. And so, yeah. And so that was the end of the road on the stage. Wow. So what, what do you do now? So what do I do now? So I've spent the last 45 years trying to make up for the very poor education I had at Italian <laughs> Ponte, right. which I haven't done too badly <laughs> with having studied history, history of art, read a huge amount, studied sort of English literature, done a, sort, of, sort of some theology, um, lots of theology courses. Um, and my family and friends are way and by far the most important part of my life. They are just yeah. kind of who I am and what's important to me. And everything else is a, a very distant second. Uh -huh. In fact, um, I, I'm hoping that in eight weeks time, I'm going to become a grandma for the first time, wow. which as I'm saying it, I'm thinking, what are you even talking about? <laughs> How can that be you? You know, don't be ridiculous. But I'm 60 this year. And um, our eldest son, I, we have three very beautiful children, and our eldest son, his wife, are expecting their first baby in eight weeks. So that is who I am. That's the core of who I am, and everything else is a very far distant. Mm -hmm. A second is, second comes in a second place. Yeah. Um, I I do. I've always done voluntary work and charity work. Um, I'm a trustee of a very wonderful char charity called Stand With Us that helps to um, teach kids on campus and in high school how to deal with anti-Semitism and Israel advocacy, positive Israel advocacy, which is never more relevant than, sadly, than now. Um, but um, I think we're doing a... a a really good job and our, our reach is far and wide um, and I'm you know involved in several other organizations similar to that um, and yeah and I you know I have we, I love traveling and I love reading and yeah Brilliant. that's that's kind of my life now and actually when you asked me what you know to come onto the show I, you know, we've talked a lot about the about Grange Hill and about the sort of the details of it, which has been hugely nostalgic. But I kind of thought, well, you know, who's interested in what I'm doing now? Really? <laughs> you know, 
I think I've got a very fabulous, interesting life, but yeah. I'm not sure that anyone else would. But I do get it because I know how iconic Grange Hill was. Yeah. And I guess in the same way that, you know, I might be interested to hear about other characters that have been on uh -huh. Grange Hill. I guess it's the same thing. But interestingly enough, I have been asked on multiple occasions to go on to Grange Hill reunion interviews, yeah. to go on to, you know, BBC um, reunion, old Grange Hill. And I've always kind of rejected it, thinking I, I it was... It feels like, as I think I said to you the first time that I spoke to you, it feels like another lifetime. Yeah. It feels like, you know, when I don't know if you know, I, I, if your listeners know, when you meet somebody from years ago that was like in a completely different part of your life, yeah. it kind of takes you back in a way that is almost, you kind of have an out-of-body experience. Yeah, yeah. And, um I mean, it's been really lovely talking about it, but it, it does feel like it was a different life. But are you still in touch with any of the cast now? No. Right. No. I mean, so I think when I when I stopped working in the business, the, it's a really, really interesting business. So I my my daughter was a um, went to was was desperate to do something and she was asked to audition for Matilda when she was 11 and I said no you're going to go to school of course you know it's so interesting that as a parent we kind of in, we in um, use all the delicious parts of our parents um, parenting and we reject the parts they don't so my mother was told she couldn't go to a you know join the Royal Ballet School and yeah. so as a result, she let me go to Italia Conti. I saw how tough the business was. Yeah. And it is tough. And, it, you know, it wasn't all fabulous and gorgeous. You know, there are some very insecure people in it who are very yeah. competitive. And, you know, it's not all fabulous and glamorous, as I'm sure everybody knows. So I said to my daughter, so when you finished university, if you still want to go and act and sing and dance, and she's actually incredibly talented. Yeah um you can do that so you know it's very interesting how you uh how you um change things yeah. according to your experiences yeah yeah but um yeah it was a it's a it's a fabulous business but it's it's inc it's incredibly challenging yeah okay well Renee we are sort of coming towards the end of the interview but I'm going to ask you the same few questions that I always ask at the end of of, of every episode so in the last sort of 12 months or so there's been talk in the news of a grain chill movie in the works you know phil, phil redmond is writing it sarah sugarman is going to be a uh, directing it but what do you think of the idea of a grain chill movie i mean i why not why yeah. not yeah. Why not? I mean, even if it is, I'm sure that if Phil Redman's got anything to do with it, it's going to be a great success because Phil Redman was just, he's just a complete legend and uh -huh. he's brilliant. And, you know, he's not only proved himself with Grange Hill, but with many other yeah. you know, television legends. Um, so I, I think if he's got anything to do with it, it'll be a success. But actually, why not? I mean, one film. You know, yeah. it's so, it was so iconic, and I think it's so nostalgic for so many people. Yeah, I, I can't tell you the number of people when I tell them that I was in grade, it puts a huge smile on their face. They really, my God, I watched Green <laughs> Hill, and I don't even yeah. recognize you. I don't know, I can't remember it, but it was a, it was huge. So yeah, yeah. why not? Brilliant. And and if you were asked, would we see a return of Pamela Cartwright? Why not? Yes, that's what we want to hear. That's Why what not? we want to hear. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay, so then, other than Pamela Cartwright, who was your favourite character in Grange Hill? I mean, I loved Trish. Yeah. I just loved Trish. I loved her kind of raw Cockney accent. I love her sort of like irreverent, look at life yeah. and her I loved her eye rolling and I just yeah yeah I thought she was great I really loved her I mean obviously Tucker yeah one has to only look <laughs> after, you know Todd Carter for creating this role that I mean literally every single person 
yeah. that you would meet of my age would remember Tucker Jenkins. Yeah, definitely. And if you couldn't have played Pamela, is there another character who you would have liked to have played then? I mean, I really felt that I was cast very well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that I was, no, I think I was well cast for Pamela. I think I was really, uh, it was very cast. In fact, funnily enough, when I remember I was let home, I was told that I could go home from school early for the first episode right. of the first series that I was in. They let me go because it was a theatre school, you know, it was quite yeah. a big deal. And I remember going home and watching it and I don't know what I was expecting. I think I was expecting some kind of great Shakespearean performance. <laughs> and it was Grain Chill. Oh, it was Grain Chill, you know, it was Grain Chill in a very where everyone was wearing the same uniform and yeah. some McCarthy, and it was like a school on, on the screen. Yeah. And I was a bit devastated. <laughs> it was kind of more Oscar-worthy. <laughs> I mean, you can only work with what you're given, can't you? You know <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so, so the, the final question is then, why do you think there's still such affection for Grange Hill? I mean, I think we've probably covered that. I just think that it was so widely watched. Yeah. It was became so iconic that it addressed these issues that just hadn't been addressed before. And I think for a series to have lasted such a long time, you know, there's really only a handful of them. Yeah. You know, Coronation Street, EastEnders, Neighbours, yeah. I mean, you know, crossroads. Do you remember crossroads? <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I, I just think, and I think more than anything, because it was the first, like, really brave television program about school, and it was so cutting edge in its subject matter. I just think, I think it's probably still people who are sort of like maybe six years older than me and 10 years younger than me, maybe in that age group, still feel a great nostalgia for it. And also because it was, there was so little else. I yeah. mean, not so little else. But yeah, no, no, you mean, yeah. Now the competition is so vast. Yeah. You know, you talk about a television programme, which might be amazing, yeah. but that you've never heard of. Yeah. Whereas everybody had heard of Grange Hill because there was so little available to watch. So. Yeah. It was quite unique. I mean, it's interesting you just said the ages there. That's probably the biggest demographic of listeners for this podcast. It's the, the age range that you've just right, said. Right, so there. from from 50 to 65. Yeah, so from, yeah, yeah. Just, yeah, it's from about that, yeah. That's probably the biggest demographic that yeah. we get. And yeah, you just said there about, you know, the topics and, and whatever that, that it covered. And I always say that, you know, that was a reason why a lot of kids weren't allowed to watch because of what it covered. But that was one of the reasons why I think my parents let me watch it because of the topics that it covered. And, you know, and then yes. I wasn't scared to ask about stuff. Yes. After that, well, that's I, beautiful. Yeah. That's beautiful. I mean, that was the, that's the most positive thing that came yeah. out of it is that, that it, you know, it opened up subjects yeah, and definitely. helped, you know, helped sort of great areas that had not a, a sort of difficulty that hadn't been addressed. Yeah. And we've seen that subsequently over the last 40 years where, you know, child abuse and and, uh, and, and mental health issues are now a much more common um, yeah. topic of, of conversation in, in sort of the, you know, open forums. And we've seen the results and, and how healthy it is. So I think Grange Hill really was quite cutting edge. Definitely. And groundbreaking. And groundbreaking is the phrase that everyone everyone says. You know, it, yes. it really, really was. Yes. It really, yeah. really was brilliant. Oh, it's been very nostalgic, Neil. I must say, I really uh, have felt very nostalgic talking about it. Yeah. All. Well. Happy days. I, I mean, thank you so much for coming on. I like. I don't oh, think. I don't know if you know, but I don't think I've stopped smiling the entire time that we've been having this conversation it, it, it's, been, it's been great talking to you and like we say you know it's been a long time coming this one because it was what 18 months ago when 
when when Lance Bears got in touch with me, so it's it's been uh, it's it's been great. I mean, I know that we have things that came up that got in the way, but honestly, for the first few months, I just thought, who? I mean, it was such a long time ago. Yeah. <laughs> I've now spoken to you for however long we've been speaking. Yeah. I really I recognise how it was it was huge. It yeah. was huge, and I I really feel very proud to have been part of it. It, 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 no, well, honestly, thank you so once again. Thank you so much for coming on. I, I, I've, I've loved talking to you. It, it, it's been brilliant seeing about your experiences. It really, really has. Really, so, really, my pleasure. Really, um, my pleasure. Well, well, yeah, thank you so much. And to anyone that's listening, I'll speak to you next time. Cheers. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Bye.